Hello everyone, today we talk about medieval communication systems and this is part of my um, series of video on medieval society and um, it's a playlist I created essentially to give a bit a broader structural dimension of what um, the medieval world was really about, at least for <laughs> obviously from, from what we know. Unfortunately we will never fully know how it really was, what, I don't know, what, what was in the mind of a of an 11th century uh, European peasant. That's something uh, we can't really grasp at a point, but we have extensive knowledge about many other things that can help us understand maybe that, that mindset. And um, and when I think of, personally, this is, this is on me really, uh, I don't know how it is for you, but what really blows more my mind relatively to the, say, the appearance of the medieval world, more than anything else, more than the absence of um, metropolis, at least in our, um, f from our standards, because, you know, if you travel across Europe, you, you find uh, many uh, little towns that um, kind of remained uh, at the Middle Ages in, 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 in some way, in, in, in size, in, in architecture, so you can maybe picture that, you can have a pretty good idea about many other things, about castles, about uh, even if also in there maybe there is a bit of um, difficult because many castles here uh, are were eventually rebuilt or but at, le at least that's something you can but at least to me the, the what freaks me out is really the idea uh, it might sound stupid but so it is the absence of highways of cars i mean if you travel into i don't know the uk germany um italy um you well yeah sure there are many beautiful natural places with relatively uncontaminated um a beautiful nature, etc. But all you see all around and you can hear it, it's highways, cars, engines. Um, it's all out there in, in, in continuously and we grew old uh, essentially uh, conceiving that and, and looking at that as a normal uh, element of l landscape. I don't know, maybe if you go to Russia um, or even in North America, that there are maybe these very huge um, spaces with really nothing in them. But first of all, you have to reach them <laughs> if they're not highways. Uh, you're kind of still not very prone to, to go in there. Um, um, if not, some special, I don't know, touristic occasions or something like that. But it's really, that's really what I think we miss. Try to imagine a world without even just little side highways but without cars and without roads uh, for, for those cars to, fa uh, to, 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 to go um, I can't personally, I can't imagine in, 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 uh, even if I personally think I have a decent um, fantasy and imagination I can't really um, there's always that thing in the back of my mind like there has to be a track somewhere where either a car or a train pass across and, and 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 I and that's it. I mean, the the Middle Ages is would be probably a disappointing um, place to to be. In fact, I realize that when we we think about the Middle Ages, we tend to stick to focus our mind into the kind of the vivacious and dynamic um, side of the Middle Ages, right? We um, that's part because of historiography, because historiography has um, it's a bit especially the one written by medievalists that are, that are specialized in, to the Middle Ages and whose horizons are set on those standards, I mean, they, you, you find that certain periods in uh, European history are emphasized, like the so-called rebirth of the year 1000, and so therefore it is, um, there is a lot of emphasis put on the uh, rebirth and the revival of trades and trade centers of cities uh, and all. And therefore, it's uh, I don't know. At least for me, when when I think of those times, I think about Europe as as, as a, an extremely uh, vivacious and um, effervescent um, and um, and um, I don't know, say that, but uh, swarming um, 
environment. So um, that kind of also fakes the the real face of what it really was compared to our standards. It was a world was what today we would consider as incredibly incredibly uh, um, uninhabited, or at least with an extremely low density of population, very slow also in 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 times in. Um, uh, on how the, the day was practically, I mean, it was a, a lot of hard work, but much more um, posed. I, I don't know how to say that. Um, so sometimes we get we get this fake uh, thoughts, but indeed um, the rise of, of European um, economy of demographics that. You know, started um, <coughs> in a consistent measure in between the, the tenth and the eleventh centuries, surely had triggered at this time a, an increase also and a bettering also in quality of the um, communication systems. Part part of of this already existed. Um, part of it was created from relatively from scratch at this at this point. So let's try to, to give a look to it and try to, to think even how these people traveled or they won't. Because what you, another thing is um, we have is, the, the, yeah, most of the people out there um, didn't really travel in, in the Middle Ages. And the majority of people were peasants, they worked the land, and that's it. But if, in, if we really look at other... Um, parts of the population, like the one lived in cities, for instance, but even the idea of the monasteries, you know, the monasteries as people permanently enclosed into the, the this monastic walls is actually also false, and one thing we get wrong, I think, is how actually, how, fa uh, how far the uh, medieval people actually traveled. Um, I think, uh, as always, one of the most underestimated uh, probably the most underestimated thing in, in human history is it's human m mobility, indeed. Uh, humans have always traveled, and it, nothing has really <laughs> ever stopped them, nor geographical um, boundaries, nor uh, the weather, um, nor even the, the, you know, the, the extreme poverty that existed uh, at this time. It was th these were mostly survival r economies substantially. Yes, from the low Middle Ages we start having something richer, we start having a lot of surplus in certain cities, but the majority of the people essentially worked in order to survive, uh, not to be, uh, not to, to, to uh, say, to buy fancy clothes or, you know, that, that was the main, the main problem. And, and the world society was, um, was uh, revolved in, 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 in great part around these dynamics. So, looking at the communication systems of Europe during the Middle Ages, the first thing uh, we necessarily have to talk was uh, is um, uh, cities, I'd say, in ancient cities, and what the Romans essentially had left in, into Europe in terms of infrastructures that were th that was actually the base on, on which the same medieval infrastructures eventually um, rose. So the this, the the European cities had been born um, prevalently on the shores of the Mediterranean, or uh, at least on, on those um, great um, um, sa um, saleable rivers, essentially. And uh, this um, happened. Um, even later, I mean, the, the same um, rebirth of medieval Europe past, um, <coughs> say, navigable rivers, not <laughs> saleable uh, rivers. Excuse me, I drink a little. <coughs> so this is kind of normal. The the uh, water um, waterways were definitely for for evident physical reasons, the, the most practicable, the word one, we will see it later, that traveling on water is much more economic than, than doing it on land. 
um, and um, <clears throat> and that's the reason why, broadly speaking, the, the Roman Empire was born in, uh, was built essentially around the Mediter Mediterranean, and into those parts of Europe that had large uh, rivers, large basins that could sustain, in that case, a certain type of economy. Um, that's why, I don't know, the, the Romans invaded Gaul and, and uh, stopped the Rhine and the Danube because essentially our lands weren't that profitable to uh, to expand in. Uh, there were also other environmental reasons for that, but uh, <coughs> generally speaking, uh, it, it's really the, mm, the communications uh, the net of communication that was uh, that made up the, the structure of eventually also of these very large empires and this and this happened also elsewhere. Think about the Yellow River in China, or uh, the Indus and the Ganges into India, or the Nile in Egypt, uh, Tigris and Euphrates into Mesopotamia. So that gives you a dimension on how the um, how the how water is really a bit the the origin of civilization in in some in some way um the uh, so the actually the building of uh, land routes so um uh, the consequent building of um <coughs> Uh, roads that could be uh, suitable for ve vehicles, substantially, um, had always been a, the great concern of, of, of antiquity. Mm. Um, so crossing or even um, um, uh, or um, um, or or even breaking perforating mountains uh, had always been a very high difficult uh, technical difficulty to 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 overcome uh, since a very early age you would be surprised at how actually ancient the ancient already ancient managed to to solve partly these problems but it's always m a problem of um, of economic convenience i mean you don't do something i mean the humans might have always done things that, that technically could have really surprised us the, the romans did certain uh, cer certain uh, mm, works that mm, altered even the landscape and um in many cases they they uh, deviated rivers they they um dried up swamps that the swamps that did do really, really a lot um but it was a matter of convenience and and, and so they, they weren't doing what couldn't ev eventually pay off in economical terms so in fact the romans did preferred like other people to to, to essentially uh, the first thing was to to create arable land i mean the base of economy at this time both in the ancient medieval times and pre-industrial times were pretty homogeneous was all about having agrarian resources fertile land to to work so um, um, the, uh, the major, usually the major uh, works were carried out, were was was reclamation, mm, bonification. I don't know how you say that. Um, the um, and not um, you know having and 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 building roads in in this sense could be difficult because roads were very long. So there were, uh, in order to build them, there were many obstacles that could be found. And uh, it's therefore obvious that the main um, that the main uh, roads existed into uh, flat into into plains into flatland, uh, but sometimes the, the 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 sheer size of trade could even push uh, for certain obstacles to be crossed to be passed. Um, certain mountain passes were kind of mandatory point of oblige points of, of passage. Um, so uh, since ancient times, uh, the Romans could uh, could uh, I mean not just Romans but in, in Europe at least um, chiefly Romans um, had carried out such works. Now the Romans, the Roman Empire, had had a a great advantage generally speaking. That is. Uh, having a huge amount of resources to spend. So, um, if you go throughout Europe and uh, you see all these uh, Roman infrastructures, then you say, well, 
that only, only the Romans did certain things. Well, it's not that really other peoples couldn't, um, but it's simply that the Romans had a sheer amount of, of resources to carry to carry it out such uh, expanses, to such works by, by investing into them. Also, the Greeks had things like paved roads. Also, the Persians had. Um, as a matter of fact, these were thing, all things, uh, I mean, cities, uh, paved roads that already originated into Mesopotamia and into Egypt, and from which eventually they, they spread, conceptually speaking and technologically speaking. But no empire like the Mediterranean one had been actually so wealthy in, um, say, at least since Augustan times. In fact, you, you realize that uh, there isn't really a, a big deal of, of Roman infrastructures that have survived from the Republican times. Um, most of what you see is from the Empire. Um, and, and, and the reason was that, indeed, Rome at that time had, from the Rome perspective, had definitely conquered the world. And, uh, and a state that owns the world, at least, <laughs> is the one that has more resources to, to invest in such big infrastructural... Um, uh, works and so the Romans uh, like also they, they, they had slaves uh, in the sense of freaking a uh, huge amount of slaves um, that made up uh, I think the largest yeah working force um, the Roman Empire so think that al also these things usually uh, not everything really um, were however largely built as a system as a social system by chiefly sla slave force um, I'm saying almost because actually for some very refined uh, constructions uh, the uh, the workforce was, was a salaried one most of the times actually. If you look at the Colosseum, but that, that is valid also for other great civilizations, like the pyramids in, into Egypt, those were built not by slaves but by salaried workers because also it was a, a sort of technical skill that was required and the average slave didn't have that so um, so but the world system was I'll say uh, on the shoulders of these millions of people w worked for um, and the um, and, and there were also other factors that actually triggered these infrastructures into the Roman Empire chiefly the military needs I mean most of what you see from an infra infrastructural point of view into the Roman Empire wasn't really about trade um, because trade has always kind of worked by itself. I mean, it's not that the Romans had to build really... Um, yeah, they, they built huge infrastructures, they they they, cre they, they created, I don't know, the current straight, they, <laughs> they uh, yeah, the, and roads were definitely important. But actually the first need, especially for the Roman highways, was actually a military one. It was the need of making the legions um, you know, crossing the pyre back and forth in case of need very quickly um, on land, then obviously on s uh, on water that was uh, even quicker. Um, <coughs> uh, so th there were actually c certain factors that had triggered a coherent um, politics of of of, uh, of uh, highways uh, construction. Mm -hmm. So when the Roman Empire say fell or at least, w w better say, what the, the, the classical world declined um, after the late antique, there is this major collapse, seemingly. It, was, mm, uh, it wasn't really, um, y you know, it, w it was a, a real collapse in, in, in structural terms. Like, the Justinian plague, as we've seen, has wiped out a, a, a major amount of uh, the Eurasian population. So, one of the first consequences of this is that uh, basically it was um, the society had changed radically. Um, the, uh, the big metropolis of the ancient world didn't exist anymore, as at least as such. So even the people, who li the few people who had remained and living in there, uh, really didn't need all those very complex and big infrastructures to work anymore. It's not because they didn't know how to make them work, but they 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 weren't forgetting it because that wasn't needed anymore. Mm? What you see, for instance, in archaeology, <coughs> is that in 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 these large uh, Roman ta uh, cities uh, that had these uh, powerful aqueducts and all, 
um, well, sometimes the aqueducts had w had gone literally destroyed. Think about the ones of Rome during the sieges, uh, during the, the Gothic War, and the, the gods destroyed all the aqueducts. So uh, th there were these active destructions in part, but even if there weren't, uh, what's the point of of maintaining such a, a big m expansive infrastructure like an aqueduct if you have to satisfy the thirst um, of uh, only of, of, of a small fraction of what the original population actually was. What you see in those cities is that the, even the, the, the se what had be usually been the center of the uh, urban life, the, where the, the Romans had built the forum, um, so the main market and all, was shifted towards other areas that up to that time had been usually peripheral, um, uh, close to rivers. Uh, it, it, the, the most brilliant example is in Rome, but there are many other uh, uh, times. Why did it happen? Well, because the Romans didn't want to leave uh, close to the, the to the river because there were frequent floods. Um, but at that point, when aqueducts didn't work anymore, uh, the the, the the most economic way to to get water was to go leave close to the river. So even if there was a flood every now and then, kind of the, the medievals kind of got used to that. It was still more convenient than keeping up an aqueduct functioning. Uh. So it's not that there is a, a real, really a regression. There is simply a um, re um, reorganization, a transformation, let's say, on on, on different bases that were the, the logical ones. Never think that the Middle Ages were a moment in which people became stupid at a point that didn't do what the, the, the people in the ancient world did. As a matter of fact, probably medievals were even more intelligent than one of the ancient world because they had to to solve problems that the, 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 the one who had come before had kind of forgotten because they had got used to this more functional civilization. Um, so never look at the Middle Ages in that under that light because it's plain uh, idiotic. Um, but uh, the um, let's say that during the the uh, the early Middle Ages in the West, uh, much uh, of of the uh, the Roman infrastructures went um, basically uh, in ruin. So the Roman roads um, were either in part or in certain cases even completely abandoned or deviated. This is an also another thing which, which shows indeed that at that point that those deviations corresponded to different needs from the ones that existed before. Uh, by the way, a new centers uh, emerged sometimes uh, with the invasions and all these problems. There is also a shift towards the the higher grounds sometimes, um, but simply maybe the worst different uh, kind of. For instance, all the uh, reclamation. Um, uh, also, that requires uh, uh, maintain maintenance. Uh, or think about di uh, about dams, um, dikes, um, and other th 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 that went ruined. So, so uh, water invaded also many man many areas once again. So, the people who lived in there had to necessarily move somewhere else. Um, so. Uh, new new roads are formed, na naturally much smaller as a system, but still pretty complex um, indeed. If you uh, even in in Roman times, it weren't just the uh, the consular arteries, uh, the big highways of of the empire. There were also many other roads that existed all along. It existed since uh, always, <laughs> we can say, since the Bronze Age. Um, and upon which actually the Romans had built, because that's it. I mean, uh, many people mm, have this technological prejudices for which uh, look at the Romans. They they built where other roads were. Uh, where do you want to build? I mean, is it, there is already a path that is the one that is normally used, and are you stupid to go build somewhere else where nobody passes? I mean. We have this kind of crazy stuff, and especially in the east, in, in, into Asia, where there were um, millinery civilization. If you take, for, isn for instance, the Achaemenid road system, something very advanced, uh, the successors of Alexander eventually built on those, and uh, and eventually the Romans uh, went there as well. So there had always been roads and tracks and uh, 
other paths that were were out there even in 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 uh, in central europe where the romans uh, only ventured sometimes and didn't really incorporate into their direct domains um, if you take in Germany or into Scandinavia and figure about the Jutland Peninsula, there were um, certain paths uh, uh, in the moors that had been um, even elevated to, to pass through uh, swamps, for instance. So uh, Germany was covered in swamps at the time. Um, so even relatively primitive peoples had this, uh, this system. So it's nothing we have to be surprised of. Um, and there were many ways you, you could adapt, uh, essentially, in, in this measure, in these um, in these uh, conditions. Um, one of the brightest examples uh, can give you a measure. Think about the Via Aurelia, um, and uh, the, the, the which in many traits of the uh, of Tuscany and Lazio. So we we're talking about the, the very heart of what the, the Roman Empire had been originally had been invaded by swamps. So this had been a major artery of communication, was very important, went through the north, um, um, that was left basically um, in, in, in ruin. Uh, another uh, element that had made Roman am infrastructures and uh, kind of declining uh, was that now uh, they as we've said maybe they they didn't they didn't even serve anymore even talking about roads think about uh, uh, the demographics and economy having contracted and therefore um, say shrunk and therefore even all such big roads were kind of uh, useless I mean probably they obviously s as long as they functioned they, they kept favoring even, even these smaller um, flux uh, of, of of trade, but um, at a certain point, maybe it was um, more useful to even dismantle those infrastructures because of the materials that could be taken from it. So they uh, th these um, these roads started to to um, to work as a sort of um, um, of um, uh, on of uh, of of stone uh, mine, <laughs> um, the, the Roman roads were were these highways were were all paved, and and, and in into the early medieval times, um, such material there was a very poor material culture, and such resources were extremely extremely precious. So these materials were taken sometimes from the ancient Roman ruins to build up other buildings. Mm? Think of all the churches that were built at this time with, with such with such materials, but not only churches, think about fortresses and all. Um, even though churches, why churches? Well, it's not just because these guys were Christian, uh, because the Roman, the Roman Empire had been um, uh, Christian also for even a, mm, some good functioning parts of its history. Um, the, the, the fact is that churches were usually had to be built from scratch, whereas a fortress could really be created um, in, this, in this sense maintained where it was. I mean, the fort if you take the Colosseum, the Colosseum was, was used as a fortress during the Middle Ages, so you, you have already that structure built there. Uh, you don't dismantle it to, to go build uh, another structure somewhere else because it's already a massive uh, piece of infrastructure. The Colosseum was mostly dismantled into into the lower Middle Ages where mm, more refined constructions were required to take uh, the marbles that, in fact there are certain churches, in, beautiful churches in Rome today that whose facades are actually built with the marble of the Colosseum. So if you want to see what the Colosseum looked like, <laughs> just look at those church's facade, but those came a bit later, during the early medieval times. By the way, this is also very fascinating. In, in early medieval times, uh, m many of these ancient Roman buildings were still relatively intact. So, another beautiful thing that fascinates me about the Middle Ages is thinking that certain 
ancient buildings that today we see relatively um, uh, exfoliated um, and were more, let's say, uh, more more intact and uh, they might, might have looked really beautiful. And so the so the new medieval roads were were essentially um it, it's not uh, they weren't paved usually at least most of the times uh they were simply uh i don't know say that un untermarked roads dirt roads their tracks uh, i mean they were not paved mm -hmm. um it, the paved roads kind of came back from from the 13th century onwards roughly obviously not always in the same places it was usually wet into western europe where partly of because of the same roman infrastructures that uh, i don't know the the, the italians the french did uh, started rebuilding paved roads because the, those were some of the wealthiest it, it's all it's always about that it's really about the resources you have and uh, and also the interests you have in terms of trade um, that dictates essentially where you can build a paved road, uh, something more uh, expansive, let's say. Um, and um, so um, the uh, another characteristics of medieval roads is they, w they weren't straight. They were really very, um, you know, they had a very <laughs> tormented tract, track. Um, uh, chiefly uh, curvy mm, in uh, devious in, in in many ways, and um, so the, the the idea was that you don't basically um, uh, you don't basically destroy the obstacles that you find because that would have costed too much and there weren't resources for doing that. You just go around that so the, the the main consequence is that uh, the 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 roads uh, the road gets longer um so even if in 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 line of air let's say the, the distance is the same there, there are longer paths to 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 go across that line um but once again that was probably the only choice uh from an economical point of view and and another characteristics that 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 uh, of medieval roads is that generally they weren't suitable for vehicles, but were usually mu mule tracks most of the times. I say most of the times because uh, naturally wagons of various kinds, um, charts and all were were passing, were the main still the main way of transporting, but it, it could be a, a much more difficult enterprise. Um, and uh, actually, the Roman roads were built ex expressly for making wagons pass on it. They even had certain um, uh, certain tracks that for which there had to be also a, a certain sta standard uh, dimension uh, distance between the wheels, so that you could go uh, access those roads. Um, if you have a um, a dirt road, just think about the problems that happen uh, when it rains and it gets all mm, essentially uh, it's impractical, you get bogged, uh, bogged down um, uh, the the, uh, the mud is, is gonna block you, so uh, even um, mm, say even medieval technology was influenced by such problems because evidently um, y they had eventually to 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 adapt to other, to search for other means for other technologies to but even uh, but sometimes the the energetic problems at this point were such for which there was in this sense a technological regression for which they had to stick to something simpler and maybe i don't know renounce to to make very long um travels uh, uh because simply that would have costed too much so even the, the whole economical system was influenced by this um and uh and things started progressing but obviously uh, once again from from the, the lower middle ages uh but there were also uh, 
certain improvements were done at the same time. Um, the uh, another major problem, really, that also had um, that mm, say another great concern was especially f for for public authority uh, authorities, let's say, better at the time, was the maintenance of uh, roads and and uh, and bridges, especially. Um, so, what do you see in, in, in the um, essentially in post Carolingian times when you have this public authority that, that, in spite of fragmented, still exists in a sort of hierarchical fashion and there are certain public rights um, to administrate uh, the, the various dis districts, uh, districts and all? Is that the maintenance of, uh, of, of roads and especially of bridges was entrusted? Uh, in every pl in every um, locality to the various lords, hmm? um, and the result was partly <laughs> a disaster <laughs> uh, because um, both roads and, and bridges were basically um, uh, left uh, on on their own. They were um, um, the um, they were neglected. This disregarded, b but not because um, of uh, negligence, but it's simply that, that there weren't resources to uh, to upkeep them, uh, to, to, to maintain them. Um, bridges were especially very, very, very important because uh, roads, as we've seen, were had mostly shrunk in size, so partly the whole um, communication net had adapted to the new needs, but crossing a, a river uh, was, um, you know, rivers hadn't declined <laughs> with the decline of the Roman Empire, they were always the same ones, so crossing a, uh, a river uh, posed always the same problem, and therefore, especially bridges were very, very, very important. What you see in to feudal Europe is that some of the most important uh, uh, fortresses were in fact built along the uh, rivers, um, and, and certain bridges were actually s fortresses um, themselves. Uh, that was a very clever uh, way to do it. You build a castle over a bridge, literally, and you leave it there so that every person who wants to pass um, either pays a toll or, or, or you, you, you block them. And even putting up a siege of, of, of such a relatively small fortress could be really um, too expensive for the times, uh, for the economical uh, standards of the time. So this meant, and this is how basically feudalism partly emerged, how all these various uh, lords grew so much in power, because they could even exploit these uh, obliged um, passage points to, to aggrandize their, uh, their, their, let's say, to, to, to augment their, their power, to enlarge it, their, their, their property, to grow uh, increasingly wealthier and increasingly wealthy and wealthier and and and, and powerful. So um, the but if you read all the various um, um, laws that were emanated during this time, um, um, say especially between the, the after in post Carolingian times, chiefly you you realize that the this uh, capitulari, uh, uh, that is this mm, series of of laws that were emanated by public authority in Carolingian, post-Carolingian Europe, uh, were extremely concerned about the ways of communication because those were vital even for the local trades, for the local, uh, for for military needs. Uh, I mean, if you have to protect a territory, you need to 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 get across that territory. If, the, if there is, a, if at every river you have to ford, you have to spend one day just to to carry that out. You need bridges to pass on. You need uh, you need roads to to go sp speedily from one side or another. And so this was very very um, uh, very important uh, to to control. And and the local communities partly found certain solutions on their own to such problems. Most of, of the local communities at this time were kind of left on their own, because uh, including uh, with their own uh, lords, they uh, sometimes they, they, they were a sort of monad. They, they worked uh, by themselves. Public authority uh, was 
almost non-existent at this time. So every single place uh, basically responded in the best way they could. And that's why uh, you find so many castles around this time. Because um, every single place uh, essentially built uh, its own. And, um, and that was the best way to defend uh, the territory in the absence of a of an overlord that could really march uh, into into space, let's say, w w in with the range of his uh, of his army into to the surrounding areas. And that, that definitely, such powers still existed, but they were not so effective most of the time. So it was better to have uh, a local force, a local f um, defense, and uh, military organization that in, in turn in fact favored the, the fragmented political fragmentation of Europe at this time. And this is what I mean. Most of these problems were based also because of the state of of the nets of communication. Um, and so since land routes were so difficult to um, to uh, to to take uh, to cross uh, the uh, trade uh, uh, rebirth of Europe started essentially from the the water routes instead. Um, so yeah, the and 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 chiefly um, not really the one on the sea. But the one in the continent, so this means essentially um, river roads. Um, the seas were definitely still, mm, eventually would have grown as the major uh, highways of, of, of medieval Europe. But d especially during the second invasions, think about with with the Vikings or, or the Saracens, there was piracy all around. And even Carolingian Europe hadn't really structured as, as, a, as, a, as a naval power at all. It was mostly, uh, you know, the emphasis was put chiefly on terrestrial, um, terrestrial um, uh, power, and um, and this obviously um, favored even um, an internal r rebirth of Europe. In many ways, the Carolingians had transformed Europe in a way from the within, mm, okay. So the, the Europe uh, starts um, kind of um, starts to rise again from the continent, mm, from the, uh, the 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 interland, from the inland, um, and and rivers uh, were, as we were saying, um, crucially important in this process. So. Uh, the trade goods were usually transported over large boats uh, with a flat bottom, so this essentially these barges, um, and uh, and used uh, along the r and uh, they were transported along the rivers, and um, so this way um, uh, of uh, this mean of communication was uh, was cheaper usually. And at least compared to to what it was, uh, it would have it would have been on on land. Um, the uh, the river uh, trade was usually safer, um, and especially could transport more goods, quantitatively speaking, in terms of mass. Um, this is what you have to think really about trade uh, about land routes that. To work extremely, it really costs a lot. I mean, there is a lot of, a, physically speaking, there is a lot of attrition in shifting a, a lot of weight in along, a, uh, uh, over a, a wagon on on a very tough ground. If you go by sea or by river, you're essentially exploiting either gravity or other wind or s or, or sea currents, and and you. Uh, you don't have to have animals, uh, um, say, energy spent mm, for uh, for carrying those uh, that same um, the same amount of of, of weight um, w uh, by 
usually animal force, that animals that had to be fed, that had to be taken by a way away from other works for which they could be useful, chiefly in agriculture. So it was much more uh, convenient to to practice certain certain um, passages, and uh, the um, and the uh, trade goods. Um, excuse me. Um, so th this process eventually triggered the rise of a g essentially great chains of urban centers across all over Europe. So rivers began to became essentially the major trade routes, uh, especially in these post Carolingian, uh, in these immediate times after the, the fall of the Carolingian Empire, from which eventually the whole the whole European economy uh, was was revived. So the most important rivers in Europe for for this trade were naturally uh, the Rhine, the Rhone, uh, the Danube, and the Po. So you you see that there they're also pretty close, right? We are roughly in Central Europe. The Rhine in Germany, uh, the Rhone in, in, in Southern France, the Danube, it's uh, roughly starting from Germany and ending up into the Black Sea. So yeah, it comes across even other lands I in the Balkans that are not extremely, they were at the time not extremely developed, but definitely kept, I mean, compared to, to Western Europe, but it kept expanding also t thanks to the Danube. Uh, and the Po River in, into northern Italy. Um, so um, these uh, rivers, uh, I mean, the communities that existed around these rivers were being so close one to another, kind of it began also to interact with each other. Uh, especially um, at this point, the, the most important axis was the one from north to, to south, um, and vice versa. So chiefly was the uh, the Italians who began to venture into the Mediterranean once again and to bring back uh, all these goods that eventually were exported across the Alps. So the Po River was extremely important because the the, the trade uh, the goods that came from the east arrived usually at from the Adriatic, so they they had to go uh, up to the Po River. So from there, eventually these goods took the way of the Alps. So they went either in Provence in France or into Germany, into the uh, Rhine Valley, and from there they could be, I mean, it's, um, uh, and, and from the France they could uh, reach up also in, into the north, of the, uh, into Central Europe, um, through the Rhone River, so, or uh, uh, the same um, Eastern goods could be actually um, imported into Central Europe from the mouth of the, of the Danube. Think about Salzburg, uh, that was named, in fact, the 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 Berg of the uh, of Salt because um, that that flourished as a center because basically through the Danube they they exported salt up to Constantinople. Uh, so you may you have to understand about the material and the spatial so dimension of such um, of such um, problems because these were. This was about problem solving, really. You know, wh what's the quickest way to 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 move uh, a good uh, over in, in space and to make money through trade? And and these rivers were the answers most of the times. And aside from these uh, four major arteries of water, there were other uh, important rivers all over Europe. Um, think about the um, the Garonne. Uh, in in France, um, so uh, th that reaches basically uh, into into southern uh, France, um, in, in to to the Atlantic. So in this area of Aquitaine, practically, um, think about uh, the Elbe River in into into Germany, to northern Germany, um, which was important because also um, the Elbe goes into uh, into into the uh, into the uh, to the North Sea and together with the Rhine, that was an um, you know th this this was a river that could connect Germany. Uh, this was a time to Germany was expanding northeastward, so the Elbe was right there, and these new centers were founded. There were were important because they began to trade with the the, the North Sea, the, the Baltic Sea, and it partly contributed to that. Uh, think about the Drava and Sava in the Balkans. 
So these rivers that in two areas were weren't excessively developed, but really began partly to to, to flourish because of these rivers, and eventually were connected to 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 the Danube. Uh, the, I mean, that were connected to the Danube and and could connect these areas of today's uh, Croatia and and Hungary to to the world, um, and um, the uh, and in into Italy. Italy had a certain think about the uh, Adige River. The Adige River is g goes up, it goes uh, down through uh, from the Alps, and the Adige Valley it was extremely important because it was the way that connected um, the main way that connected Germany to Italy. There was a lot of trade being developed in there. Then the Adige goes into the Adriatic Sea, and it passes through important cities that began to flourish at the time. Think of the Arno River into Tuscany. Basically, the Tuscan civilization, Middle Ages, the Renaissance uh, starts basically around the the Arno River that crosses Florence, uh, Pisa. So very important cities, very important centers. That whose fortune was also made thanks to such uh, such a river. So and and many other rivers all over all over uh, Europe that were I think also about the great uh, rivers in the um, of, of Russia uh, that were so important because they connected the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea or the Caspian Sea um, and were these major high, uh, highways and uh, at the time and were so so important for making the uh, medieval Russia uh, flourish uh, in the uh, in the think the, the Kievan Rus, for instance, and uh, so many other rivers all over, that even small ones that uh, were used for in locally speaking were very important. There was also a lot of deal of, of fishing around rivers. Um, um, uh, th this time, certain canalization is started, partly. Uh, the, the, I think about the, the the Netherlands, where lots of of, um, of channels were built at this time, uh, started being being built, um, obviously all for for agricultural reasons, and uh, also for stopping floods and also very, uh, the face of Europe is changing through these um, water roads, in many ways, um, so. Um, another very important thing to remember is that the the new communication system was forming to the low middle ages was essentially a mixed one because these major um, routes that cross the European continent usually mm, uh, entailed a passage both through land and and and, and, and water so by the way, for instance, um, we've seen how rivers were used as, as as waterways, but it often happened that there were roads that were built in parallel to the rivers. So where it was possible, and it was very important because there were, first of all, lots of cities that were built around these rivers. So also crossing rivers, uh, ex excuse me, and, and navigating rivers weren't, wasn't that uh, cheap in the sense that maybe at every city you had you were stopped by the local lord that wanted to make you pay for passing there and and, and naturally if you wanted to trade w with any any center you had to pay a toll and 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 that's the reason why that center had developed in the first place with all the uh, wealth accumulated from this taxation um so and uh, and were many stopping points at which you had uh, say to to go by land by river, then you had to make another mm, trade by land. But then once again by river, think about the passage, for instance, between the Danube and the Rhine. The Danube and the Rhine have very very close springs into south southern southwestern Germany. So uh, if you wanted to, I don't know, sail up the Danube up to. Uh, I don't know from from the Black Sea into until uh, up to Germany, you could do that. And then, if you wanted to go into the North Sea, you have to do uh, one um, uh, one step by land, take the Rhine and go up there. And there were I don't know where the first channel because today I think the Danube and the Rhine are channeled, uh, evidently. Um, um, I don't know where this first began, but uh, even if you take 
city. Think about Strasbourg. I think Strasbourg, from a very early age, it was a very a, a crucial city. It's it's a bit of the symbol of Europe because it's perfectly uh, distant from France, Germany, and Italy. Uh, it, it was an extremely and and that is connected with with uh, with many channels with through through the Rhine. It's a very important. So there was a lot of also engineering involved into into this process, and it all um, worked. Um, everything worked accordingly. Fi think about the effort. Think about all the energies that were put in motion d d d to 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 achieve such such amazing results for for the time. We like to remember the Romans, but think of also the medievals. What what the hell? They have done amazing things. Um, so um, there were also certain mountain passes we usually crossed at. Uh, uh, on on uh, on on donkey back, <laughs> um, so they they were also very adventurous um, travels. Uh, they were very adventurous journeys, and think about also uh, brigands and think about the weather conditions at the time. Uh, I mean, it, these are not really there was weren't they weren't simple journeys really. But they made it anyway, and trade went on, and um, and it grew, and these roads, um, these routes were kind of increasingly served by better infrastructures. Mm. Whether it was in rivers or, or on land, uh, there was a lot of business that was naturally also created over it. Uh, it was a major, just making an example of these um, parallel roads that existed, for instance, across the river. There was a line that was that ran parallel to the Rhine River that connected the major... Um, uh, we have talked about uh, this um, uh, north-south axis between uh, in, in Europe that was the most uh, trafficated, say, at the time. And um, just imagine you wanted... you were an English merchant and he wanted to from London, say, that was rising fastly uh, in this uh, moment as, as a trade center. And uh, you wanted to reach up to Constantinople, let's assume. So a very long journey. Um, you left with some boat, with some ships from, from, from London, from uh, the Times. Uh, and uh, from Thames, sorry, not the Thames. <laughs> from Thames, uh, you you went out Thames mouth, and you reached some mm, some ports, probably in France or in Belgium, mm, and and then you reached the the Rhine mouth. Then from the Rhine mouth, there was this. You could go either on 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 water or on land, and was this this route that connected basically all the major Rhine uh, um, cities. So you arrived in Cologne. Cologne, in fact, was this major, I think it was the largest city in Germany, uh, as well as one of the largest in Europe. Um, and Cologne was extremely important for trade with England, not surprisingly through the Rhine, in this sense, because it was well connected to the, to the North Sea and and um, for instance, the Saxons at this time, the Duchy of Saxony, was allied with, with the Kingdom of England, also partly because they had this uh, big um, economical tr um, trade interest in, in common. So the first city, Cologne, then Mainz, then Worms, then Speyer, and then from there, you basically have come south of Germany. So at a certain point you had to reach Italy. So how do you reach Italy and the Po Valley? You, you basically have to cross the Alps, evidently. So uh, this happened usually through the uh, Spluga Pass. So from the Spluga Pass you entered into the, um, uh, the Po uh, site, we can say, of the Po Valley, um, and you reached up Milan. Milan at this time was, I think, either the first or the second largest city in Europe. Uh, it w the, the other one was Paris, essentially. But I think Milan, at a certain point, at least in the 12th century, was larger even. So this major trade center of the Po Ballet. So from Milan, you arrived pretty pretty easily to either... I mean, you had some options. You could either go to Genoa, 
especially, I don't know, if you wanted to reach Sicily or you wanted... Um, because Sicily was, um, you know, a great grain, ex grain export area. And uh, uh, you, might, you might have been a crusader, this is, this is true, or you wanted to embark for the Holy Land, and you, you could go either, you might have gone also through, uh, through the Rhone, uh, to Marseille, but usually it was Genoa. Uh, the, the best port for reaching there. So from Genoa you could go to, to Messina, for instance, and from there to, to the Holy Land. And uh, so you could reach Genoa, just had to cross the uh, other mountains uh, before reaching that, but it was pretty easy. Um, either you, co you could go from Milan to the Po River in the south, at uh, Pavia, from Pavia, let's say, or, or from Piacenza, let's say, and you could sail up to, to Venice uh, on the Po River, and then, um, so you reached into Venice, and uh, from there you could take a ship and go to Constantinople. Um, otherwise you could go, you could reach up to the, uh, the Italian, uh, the Apennine uh, route. You could reach up to Piacenza, once again, uh, from Milan, it's pretty close. Um, the Piacenza was extremely important into the Middle Ages because it, it was this meeting point of the major medieval Italian artery that was the so-called um, uh, Via Francigena. That is basically uh, the name that uh, it took its name from France because um, because all the because it, it was the first it was the route from which the French pilgrims reached Rome and. Or, or, or went even beyond, wanted to go into the Holy Land, into Jerusalem, say. Um, and so from there, they would arrive from the Great San Bernard uh, Pass, and they would uh, arrive essentially into Piedmont, so passing to Ivrea, Vercelli, and then Pavia, and then, in fact, crossing the Po, uh, uh, arriving to Piacenza. So for from Piacenza, you could um, go either to Parma, or trying to venture into the Apennine, the Apennine and um, you you would cross the Apennine in the ch at the Chisa Pass. So after the Chisa Pass, you pass from the Po Valley into the Arno Valley into Tuscany. And so from you cross Old Tuscany, you arrived at, at Siena mm, in the south of Tuscany, and from there you took the the ancient uh, Roman consular road the the Cassia road and and and, and that and through the Cassia you, you arrived straight to to Rome so from Rome uh, then you could take the uh, Appia Traiana road famous Appia uh, it was another consular uh, uh, Roman consular road and you reached up to straight you 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 went through the Apennines and you went into Apulia and then, so you reach the Apulian ports on the Adriatic Sea, and um, uh, you could cross. Either you could embark towards Constantinople, but uh, you could also embark at um, Brindisi. Mm -hmm. uh, so you basically you cross the um, the Otranto uh, Strait from between Italy and and uh, and uh, and the Balkans. So I arrived into into today's Albania, basically you would reach up to um, Durakion, which was uh, uh, this main city on the uh, on the Adriatic Sea, from which the Ignatia uh, Road started. This was uh, another very ancient, um, say, uh, Balkanic, then eventually Roman road, that connected straight from west to east Durakion to Constantinople. Hmm? And once you arrived to Constantinople, you were done. So you see many options. Then from Constantinople, you could decide to, to go into Asia Minor, into to the Holy Land, where other paths. Now it's complicated, but just to give you an idea of, you know, the, eff the effective dynamism that existed into this... into this... Um, communications in many ways and and how this eventually uh, also triggered the rise of certain local uh, centers and uh, 
And how is influence trade? I actually made other videos on how the major um, uh, European uh, medieval European trade routes and uh, I discussed this partly and you notice that uh, at a certain point for chiefly for, for political reasons uh, rather than than uh, strictly economical ones um, the um, there were many there were sometimes in, in medieval history many big shifts of certain of certain um, certain trade routes. Um, for instance, I made... Uh, let me see here... In medieval society videos, I, in medieval, medieval society playlist, I made a lot of video about this. Um, I made... European commercial expansion during the 13th century, in which I can't explain that. Uh, rise and fall of the Champagne fairs. That, that that is what I was thinking about because basically, around the late 13th and 14th century, that ancient route that went across France from Marseille to to the Rhone uh, through the Rhone Valley into um, in towards the Ile de France, uh, at a cer and then to towards the north. At a certain point was shifted because from Italy there was either a path that took uh, the Atlantic road passing the Gibraltar Strait uh, through through sea or or a land road was developed that between uh, Italy and, and Germany so basically France remained a bit cut off and were also the there was the hundred years war at the time so was also ravaging in in France so as a merchant you 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 would have not liked to go to go through France with those major devastation that the major the all everything framed naturally in the main in the greater European crisis of the fourteenth century so a lot of changes that actually occurred at this time there were also many other major trades starting between uh Russia and England at the time because the Russians began or in this age to, to export grain uh, in great plenty. Even, d even d during the modern age there were certain countries um, even as far as Portugal that depended on, on partly on Russian grain. So think, start thinking out how Europe was getting interconnected at, a, at such a very early age um, and it had always been in some measure. So yeah, th there are all these implications. I think they're very interesting because I love geography um, and I love... Ah, yeah, I've made another video. This is good, perhaps. Um, evolution of European trade routes in low Middle Ages. Yeah, that's where I discussed the, the French thing there. Um, yeah, so this is it. And um, I don't know. And for, for today, I think it's it's fine to finish here. So I hope that you enjoyed this video and if you did please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now I thank you heartily for listening to me, I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.